So good morning, everybody. Um, there's been this idea, I think, floating around that there is a great reckoning coming to, to higher education. This sense that, you know, centuries old institutions, these ancient seats of learning are facing a bit of a moment of truth. Uh, this was an idea that was um, given in an interview with, with my organization, Times Higher Education, by Fernando Ramirez. He's a Harvard professor and he was a, a member of the um, UNESCO Commission on the Futures of Education. And he said, um, in recent decades, the public and politicians are increasingly asking, what good do universities do for society? Who do they serve? And he said, I think that's causing a reckoning, perhaps of comparable significance to the reckoning that led to the last major transformation of the university. Is that guy here somewhere? After the Second World War. <laughs> so, you know, it seems to me absolutely obvious that universities are seizing this moment. You know, there's no question that they are of tremendous public good. We've seen that perhaps during the, the pandemic more starkly than ever before, not just the Oxford vaccine and the Johns Hopkins data sets and the Imperial College modeling. We've seen it on the, the armies of skilled graduates on the front line of healthcare. We've seen it through the economists, the epidemiologists, the modelers and the volunteers of students, immense public good. But it's kind of like the public hasn't quite got it. We haven't quite sold that uh, to the, to the taxpaying public, certainly to certain politicians. So I think there is this moment universities have to seize this, um, this opportunity. And rankings don't really help. You know, the traditional college rankings reward the kind of things that actually alienate people at a time when universities perhaps need to do more than ever to open up access, to be more inclusive. You've got rankings that actually reward universities for turning away a higher number of students. You've got some really uh, strange metrics based on wealth and prestige, which actually perpetuate some of the challenges, some of the sense that universities potentially are a little bit aloof, a little bit out of touch. So at Times Higher Education, my organization is trying to disrupt rankings. We actually produce the world university rankings. We've done that for 20 odd years, but we're disrupting ourselves. We're disrupting our own uh, model. We often talk about ourselves as a 50 year old startup. We're trying to take a fresh approach to understanding excellence. So we produced the impact rankings. These are based entirely on university social and economic impact. We've used the framework of the sustainable development goals to understand excellence across the entire 17 goals. So that's not just climate action, life underwater, life on land, renewables. It's actually about eradicating poverty. It's about zero hunger. It's about decent work and economic growth. So it's an amazing framework to understand that sort of social and economic good that universities do. So we've got an amazing panel to discuss this. I did promise in the session blurb that there'd be some previews. The rankings are out on the 27th of April. Um, and I can't give too much away, but I will say that of the top 10, there are eight countries represented, which is an amazing diversity. Usually global rankings, it's pretty much just the US and the UK. Um, of the 17 SDGs, I think we have 13 different countries in number one positions. We have 1,500 participants in this new ranking that's only a few years old. So I'm absolutely thrilled that um, a couple of the universities represented here today are pioneers in this area, pioneers of social good. Um, needing no introduction, of course, we have Michael Crow from ASU. Uh, we have Joy Johnson from Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, and joining them, we have YSG, the chairman of Elsevier, the leading provider of information and analytics for global research and health. And I'm also delighted we're joined by Mary Papazian, the former president of San Jose State University, and now with um, Rep4. So let's get into the conversations. Um, maybe I'll turn to you first, Joy. Is there a reckoning? Is, it, is this real? Is there a genuine sense as a university leader that you're confronting these issues? You feel that you have to work harder to justify your public good or demonstrate that public good? Um, well, thank you, and it's really a pleasure to be here today um, and to be joining the conversation. Uh, yes, I think there is a reckoning, and I must say we at Simon Fraser University welcome the reckoning. Uh, it is about time, and uh, I think that we all recognize that as Simon Fraser University is a public institution, that we have obligations. Um, we have obligations to serve the public good. I think the reckoning has come, and we all recognize it, because of uh, a number of the social dynamics that are happening right now in the world. Um, and we are certainly paying attention to these um, dynamics uh, globally. 
uh, issues related to uh, inequities that the pandemic has shone a light upon, uh, issues related to racism that we've seen uh, globally. Um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement um, certainly took its roots here in the United States, but has certainly had impacts in Canada as well. And I will also say for us in Canada, uh, our work on reconciliation with Indigenous people has also brought us to a reckoning. And I do want to take the opportunity to recognize the Indigenous lands that we are on here today as well, the Kumeyaay people. So I, I do think it's time for us to think not only about our programming, but how we can use our infrastructure, how we can use um, uh, our resources um, for social good. And certainly at Simon Fraser University, um, I'd say uh, this has been in our DNA for quite some time. Our vision is to be an engaged university, and by that I mean a university that's out in the world working with people, uh, using our knowledge, using uh, our resources uh, in any way that we can. So, uh, and I love this notion, and the, the UNESCO report on global education is also pushing us to think about the canon of the university, what gets taught, because what has been taught in the university has primarily been um, a canon um, of Western European thought, and I think again we're beginning to think a new about opening the canon, cracking it open, thinking about other forms of knowledge as well. So it's an exciting time and uh, we're looking forward to further discussion about this today. Thank you very much indeed. Michael, what's your sense of this, uh, this moment of truth? Yeah, reckoning. So when my dad would come home, half the time he'd come home, there was a reckoning when he arrived. And so, <laughs> so, so uh, and when I was growing up, so reckoning is something I'm really used to. And so, uh, uh, I'd say that uh, not only is there a reckoning, it's far too inadequate. Uh, I've been trying to come up with a way to actually write this up, and I've written a lot about sustainability, but I'm working on this concept where I'm gonna try to assign responsibility for how did we actually become so stupid and uh, bring ourselves to the brink of uh, destabilizing the natural systems on which we're completely, utterly, and totally dependent for our entire existence, and how did we actually do this? And so. I attribute some of it to the fossil fuel industry, <clears throat> some of it to uh, the transportation sector, et cetera, et cetera. But on my list of top five are colleges and universities as being responsible. I want you to listen to this very carefully, responsible. We decided to allow the disciplines not to talk to each other. We decided to go ahead and produce you know, thousands of chemical structures and chemical manufacturing techniques and all these other tools. And somebody said, well, somebody else will solve all these other problems. And we decided to not make we decided to create a hierarchy of knowledge which says that physics is more important than chemistry and chemistry is more important than biology and biology is certainly more important than ecology and all of that is wildly more important than the idiots that are in the social sciences. And so we've put ourselves into this situation where we have been stupefied by ourselves. And so the reckoning is that we did not understand how to intellectually design a teaching, learning and discovery organization capable of actually keeping us from killing ourselves. Uh, and so uh, it's unbelievable almost, it's, it, and, and it still goes on. And so, so I've been involved in redesigning <coughs> universities in my last two jobs. So more than 10 years at Columbia University where I was deputy provost and the designer of a thing called the Earth Institute, which I was the first director of and got going off the ground. And then the last 20 years now at ASU, where we've built the Global Futures Laboratory and the School for Sustainability and the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, and I won't go through the long, long list, but we're moving at speeds slower than the present transformation of the planet. So, so the other thing that got thrown away in universities eons ago was the notion of time. It's gone. There's no time. The, the smallest unit of time is a semester. Oh, okay, what's that? That's a made-up thing. And so, and so, so the, 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 the reckoning that we should be under is, what are you going to do about it? We gave you all this privilege at the universities. We gave you every benefit that society has to offer. We allow people to give you money and get their taxes written off. We give you money from the taxpayers. We let you go on sabbatical every, every seven years. We let you study whatever you want to study. We let you organize yourself however you want to organize yourself. And what did you do? You helped create all of this. And so the reckoning is insufficient. And the reckoning should be at the actual structure and design of the intellectual enterprise that we think of as a university. So I, I'll pick an area not related to climate change, but is something I've written about also, which is, you tell me why chemistry faculty members have built over the last few hundred years, 200 years or so, tens of thousands of 
of human-made synthetic, call them synthetic molecules, that cause cancer in humans. Why, why would you do that? Why would you not start out from the beginning to think about designing molecules that don't cause cancer in humans or don't cause ecosystems to be destroyed? And so a few years from now when you wake up and somebody says, and most people don't even know what this means, all the bees are dead. They're all dead. Oh, okay, no more honey. Oh, forget it. Honey is nothing. It's a luxury. No more pollination of anything. Now, we're not moving there immediately, but we've created a dynamic set of situations where the ecologists who are held hierarchically down are not regarded sufficiently important enough to be equal to the chemists, and so therefore the chemists get to do whatever they want, and they all love me anyway. Uh, and so the, 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 rec the reckoning is insufficient. We need a much more significant reckoning going to the design of the institution itself. And I think some of the, um, one of the beauties of looking at the SDGs in the round is that they are inherently requiring people to cross disciplines. They oh, absolutely yeah. bring in. That's the great thing about there. goals like that because they're actually meaningful. So, you know, the right. goal is not how many publications do you have in journal X, Y, or Z, but an SDG is what is your university doing to contribute to the attainment of these really important globally identified goals. Well, and, and if I may, the, the one dis area of discipline, Michael, that you didn't mention were the humanities because they lagged so far behind that they weren't even presumably worth the no, mention. Yes. But if you really think about, uh, yes, exactly, but if you really think about addressing um, the problems that we face that we're gonna talk about today, it requires thinking in terms, not just of advancing the science, but thinking about the impact on human communities, which starts really from being able to imagine what that is and to talk about it. And I think, uh, and I would agree with you, that the speed of time for the reckoning uh, continues to increase and enhance, and now we're actually facing an urgency where the planet itself won't be able to support us if we're not careful. We have had a luxury of a cushion where we haven't needed to actually create change, and institutions of higher education, by definition, are conservative with a small c. They're built to be that. They started out that way in the old medieval period in the monasteries. They were supposed to be separate from time. They thought about the intellectual life, and they didn't necessarily think about the impact and the connection with um, the responsibility on the social good that we face today. And I would say here in the United States, and we certainly see that at institutions like my former institution, in San Jose State, and it's so many, we focus so much on the individual advancement, the individual student, but we don't always think about how the power of the collective of the university, individually as a university, but collectively as universities, working together in collaboration, can actually bring forward that public good that Joy spoke to earlier. Thank you. Well, yes, you're the one representative who's not from university. You've got a, a, a good external view. Obviously, you are one of the arbiters of global science through, through Elsevier and all the journals. What, what, what's your response to the idea of a reckoning and what can Elsevier do as in partnership with universities to, to address this issue? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming to sit next to three incredibly accomplished scholars who are also institutional leaders. Um, and what we heard from the three of them is often what actually I say in different panels. But because three of them have said it, I'm going to try to play a different role and see if I can you know, challenge the other side. Because I actually agree with all of you, but um, university, as much as it tries to be independent of the speed and the flow of the society, is supposed to remain the small c conservative in terms of trying to play the opposite force, right? The stable force, the long-term force, and we still seek that from universities. The reason why the chemists have come up with all those chemical compounds that are not uh, reversible <laughs> is because they were either going with what was expected at that time from the society. We needed less expensive material that would serve the purpose that, that plastics, for example, have served. Or because we didn't know the consequence of that. We didn't know that they just weren't going to be um, self-destructive over a short period of time. So we've done a lot of things kind of not knowing, and that was what we encourage people to do today at university, right? Take chances, take, make experiments, 
you know, try out. So I think that you three are incredibly um, self-humbling about the university and its past role. But I think, in my opinion, you need to do what you have been always doing, actually. So the reckoning is, how do you do what you used to do, which is experiment, find new, new territory in knowledge and understanding without, um, with a little more sensibility to what the consequences might be, as far as we know today, as far as we know today. So I applaud these three institutions that are clearly pioneers. I mean, you're leaders. That's why, you know, your universities are so well recognized for SDG um, uh, leadership. But I, I really think that there's a role of university that just should not change. And I say that, you know, especially Michael, because I sit inside uh, as, a, as a trustee of universities and I get to see some of this. And I think that from a corporate perspective, gosh, I wish I were in your shoes sometimes. I mean, I, I don't disagree the not change part. I mean, just to take that point, I mean, it's not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's yeah. no longer being a baby. And so, uh, so a, a baby says, you know, I'm just going to do this because I can do it. And so it's about an increase in sophistication. It's an increase in a logic. And so it doesn't mean that the fundamental search for core knowledge of nature isn't undertaken at the universities in unbounded ways, because certainly you need that. But the, the, the notion of there being some social hierarchy to that knowledge, which then is a function of the design of the universities, is actually detrimental to our outcome. And that's different than cutting someone off. It just means you're doing what you're doing in discipline A or discipline B and the humanities and the social sciences and the behavioral sciences. So global climate change is largely a behavioral issue as opposed to a scientific issue. Uh, and and, and we, haven't, we haven't figured that out and we don't allow those things to emerge. I, th I think the other point I would make is that um, uh, university administration um, has the opportunity to pull some levers and to direct the scholarship in particular directions and to, to put challenges down. But to your point, to, you know, we do, you know, we want to also celebrate the ability to ask questions, to, to develop new knowledge, um, to, to, to really forge new frontiers. Um, but I think that what Michael was also talking about in terms of the structures he's developed uh, at, at the, the university he represents is that there's a way to do that to really help align the work as we move forward. I think we'll, we really need to tackle some of those inherent structural challenges as part of this. Um, but I just wanted to reflect a bit more, if, if, you, if I may, on the, the public perception issue, the mechanisms of how we look at our universities and understand excellence. And obviously, there's a sort of theme around league tables here and metrics and data. Michael, I just wouldn't mind coming back to you on the, the issue around how we understand excellence or how the public and the, and the politicians understand excellence in the current framework and whether that's actually something that does need to be tackled. I mean, First, I politics has always been complicated. There's always been multiple voices and multiple views. There's always been arguments about education, science, all those things, and there always will be. So none of that is ever going to go away. Just the nature of the arguments or the level of informedness mm -hmm. will change relative to those arguments, relative to the public. The universities, unfortunately, have evolved in the last few decades to being viewed as elite or elitist. Uh, and that then separates them from then the broad swath of society and then creates this negative energy towards some universities. I mean, so much so that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts General Assembly decided to tax the large endowments in Massachusetts. The government of the United States, the Congress of the United States, is now taxing all the large university endowments. Those are, those are let me get your attention now, stupid. Uh, these are, these are, they're not really wanting to take money away. They're wanting to say, I need you to do more. Yeah. And so the, the issue is, is that the universities <clears throat> have underestimated their, their impact and their influence and are not taking the broader social responsibility for communicating constantly with the, with the public about what they're doing. And then we've also, uh, you know, back to uh, YS's point, we've also failed at the job of communicating. So, so if you didn't see the movie, don't look up, see the movie, don't look up, because it's an unbelievable critique of academia also, which is they just keep screaming at the top of their lungs, it's the data, it's the data. <laughs> Nobody knows what the data is, no one knows what that means, no one knows how you calculate this stuff. <laughs> and so if we don't figure out how to communicate, 
this gap between the general public and the universities is going to accelerate until we get torches at the door. So, and that's that's possible. Torches at the door are now in the realm of possibility. And Mary, can I just, is, is this part of the problem is we, we frame it as a private gain of the individual, a consumer issue rather than a, a much broader societal issue. I guess there's a natural element there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I think that actually is part of it. But I would say this, that um, when you look at some of the surveys, and ACE did some recent surveys as well, there actually is strong confidence in the local institutions. So the further an institution you go, uh, further from an institution you go, then there's more of a negative consequence. It's the same kind of thing where people really like their own Congress uh, representative, but they don't like Congress. Uh, and so we actually do see that in higher education. And it's one of the reasons why communities fight for institutions not to close, for example, or not to merge because they do see their value. So I think it's a little bit more nuanced than just uh, anti-higher um, ed. But I, I think this notion of the public and the private is really important. If you look at some of the rankings, and rankings by themselves are a problem because we want to create a taxonomy where in a ranking there's only one at the top. And so by definition, when you're at the top, you're better than the one that's second, than the one that's third, et cetera. Rather than say, we have these values and we want to really celebrate institutions that follow, for example, the broader global interdependent um, goals in the SDGs, for example, just as, as one, one kind of thing. But we focus a lot on the individual student. Social mobility rankings, for example, are about the individual student. How many of these students do we bring in at the lower levels of the socioeconomic class? class, first gen students, et cetera, and how do we set them up for success so that they can have a thriving, you know, uh, successful life, all right? But that, and that's important, and that's good, and we do that. Um, but it's a both and, it's not an either or. We also have a responsibility, whether we're public or private, in the public good, because certainly in the United States, private institutions benefit from the public through tax exempt status, that's a public benefit, um, and, and, and other kinds of things. And so how do we see that responsibility? And again, the elite rankings are a bit of a problem here. Because if you look at where most students are educated, where most of us work, they're in large public universities uh, that bring a different frame, different lived experience, and different set, I think, of sensitivities to some of these challenges that the SDGs represent, which is really how do you really succeed in a developing world? How do you create and represent that global interdependent point of view? and address problems of emerging challenge. Uh, elite institutions are already privileged, right? So they're not thinking in, those, uh, in, in that same, same perspective, I think. It is remarkable when you look at those surveys where people, often in the US, it's majority Republicans, they say they don't think their universities are doing good for the world, but actually when you look at their local institution, it's often, oh no, not that one, that one's great, we love that one. It's a remarkable story. Maybe we could broaden it out then. So, so, YS, maybe going back to you, the, the idea of the SDGs becoming a galvanizing framework for understanding excellence. I mean, I think, you know, Michael's point around the lack of interdisciplinary thinking, mm. academia, universities are brilliant because they're curiosity driven, because they allow scholars to just go and pursue outcomes without necessarily knowing where they're going with that. And that can produce really bad outcomes as well as good ones. Do you think the SDGs actually create an opportunity to then understand every step in a different context in a sense of what what potential harm might this do and i'm thinking you know more and more now around just to say every step but it's certainly better than anything else we've had so far right yeah. so i got very excited when you asked me to join this panel uh because stg for us uh was the first attempt at having a framework that was so comprehensive and as michael says so interconnected mm -hmm. right and, uh, and so as a company that has access to uh, scholarship material, we thought we could take a part in it. Uh, we learned that I think there are three real benefits to SDG being the framework. One is how universities behave themselves, right? In your own output of, of for example, uh, uh, carbon footprint or gender equality and, and access and opportunity and, and collaboration. The second is through your research, because we do need research, in-depth and cross-disciplinary research, and that's what you do. You're the, almost the only ones you do, uh, and fundamental, applied, and application. And then third is that 
is for me the most exciting, and that is you shape the minds of the future people who are going to be sitting at this podium. You have the chance to make sure that the students know, even if they come in with passion for a certain part of SEG, to let them know that university will support you in preparing yourself to be the leader that is much more responsible, right? So for those three reasons, I think that SCG is a great framework. Now, I, just one more comment as being the pri for-profit sector person. Mm -hmm. um, we used to do, and we still do, what we're measured. And we were measured for so long, on, at least in this country, on quarterly earnings. Mm -hmm. So guess what CEOs did? They focused on quarterly earnings. Now, if you go to corporations, it's all about ESG. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness we have a different measurement than quarterly earnings. Six years ago at uh, Summit of the Americas, I was on a panel where I suggested that the real thing that we need as corporation, private sector, was s different CEO, not chief executive officer, but chief ethics officer, because corporations have gotten really rotten. And Imagine how much progress we've made in ESG since then. So I think it's, if we use the right tool to measure, I think universities will absolutely do the right thing and do it really well and fast. Joy, please do come in. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, I, I loved your introduction where you said you um, uh, had some issues with rankings, and I think we've heard um, some concerns about rankings, which is slightly ironic, but uh, anyhow, uh, it's interesting. I, I will say, um, when we first heard that the Times Higher Education was going to um, develop an impact ranking, there was a lot of discussion about it, and um, I think in part there was discussion and concern about the monetization of the UN Sustainability Development goals and a question about should they be utilized for this purpose and I think that's a good question for us to continue to think about. Uh, we sat out the first round and in part because we were still having a discussion with our community about what does this mean, uh, you know, are we going to jump on the ship and what will it mean. But we did join in the second round and have been really pleased to do so, and in part because it holds a mirror up to ourselves. It has provided us with a tool to actually organize and think about our own work and have a conversation across our community. And we've learned some interesting things. Uh, we've learned uh, what we're doing really well. Um, and have surprised ourselves because as a university with 37,000 students, three campuses and thousands of faculty and staff, we didn't even have a good you know, finger on what was really happening. Um, so we've learned a lot, uh, but we've also, I think more importantly, learned where the gaps are and where we need to continue to push ourselves. Um, through the process, the university has also really embraced the SDGs as an organizing factor for the university, which has been very helpful. But the other thing I would say that's been useful is that in international audiences, we've got a common um, um, framework um, for discussing ways that we might work together. So when I go off to uh, talk to someone in Korea, there's an understanding of what SDGs are. We can talk about SDG 13, what we're doing in that regard, and, and really join forces quite quickly. So I think that's been very helpful as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think there are gaps in the SDGs, and it'll be interesting to see where the UN takes this as we move forward together. But I think the accountability um, for us, at least, has been the most powerful thing as we've moved forward. Yeah, and I think, Michael, you're involved in working out what happens after 2030, aren't you, in terms of the uh, the goals and targets and you were mentioning. Trying. <laughs> but can I ask you, just to go back to your original point around, you know, university's culpability almost, is that something, I, you see across the world now, universities are increasingly organizing themselves, not down departmental uh, verticals, but around shared goals, you know, often the grand challenges themselves form part of the actual structure of the institution because they want that interdisciplinarity. What, what needs to change, do you think, or what, what's ASU doing, but what needs to change in the sector yeah, to I try mean, and encourage that interdisciplinarity? There, 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 aren't, there aren't a lot of universities that are doing that at, at scale because we're overly, the technical term is isomorphic, that is we tend to replicate each other to strive to success in a narrow, a narrow pathway. And so the one thing that I would say that the world needs for all of the thousands and thousands of universities that are around the planet, and it's a, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry, uh, it is monetized uh, in every possible way, uh, 
uh, at a, at, in, 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 in very significant ways, both through private investment uh, as well as public investment, <clears throat> is we need to uh, permit much more variety. So let's imagine that the number of, ta number of chairs in this room, uh, 100, uh, that we have 100 types of colleges and universities or more. And then within each of those types, each of those types are now pursuing different angles. And so it would allow for a much, you know, rather than having, I don't know how many journals you guys put out, but how many is it? Thousand? thousand? Yeah. So rather than two and a half thousand journals, believe it or not, maybe we actually need 25,000 journals. And what I mean by that is if you think that we're actually tackling the complexity of the intellectual challenges that our species has going forward, we're not. We don't have enough outlets, we don't have enough teams, we don't have enough variety. We should have hundreds of types of universities. They shouldn't be compared and ranked against each other relative to some isomorphic replication pathway. They should be within their category. Well, how are they doing within that category relative to all kinds of things? And so the design question is actually a really big design question. We need more variety in each university. And what I mean by different universities, it means like, why does every university have a political science department? You don't need a political science department. Maybe some universities should have things on the design of public uh, uh, value uh, institutions. Uh, you know, maybe there should be completely different ways that they're approaching similar things. And that would give us the broader toolkits that we need. We, we need to stop producing the same thing in a line where everything is ranked, the graduates are ranked, the incoming students are ranked, the programs are ranked. I mean, that is just super silly. I think that's such a great point. Um, yesterday, the book uh, Good to Great was mentioned, and uh, the challenge there is best of your kind. How yeah. can you be best of your kind? Yeah. How can you think about what you want to do as an institution? With as many kind as possible. Exactly, right. exactly. And I would say that I think we're going to be pushed in that direction by our students. And when you really listen to to the younger generation, um, not all students are young, of course, they're they're across the the spectrum. But but the emerging generation, they want to have impact. I mean, they the, the first thing they talk about is impact, and they are pressing us if we listen to them carefully to create different kinds of opportunities for them that are actually interdisciplinary. What we found at San Jose State, we're just launching a new uh, honors program. It's not really a traditional honors program. It's called Honors X, and it's not, doesn't have those, those uh, grade point average expectations. It's for juniors and seniors, transfer students. It's a very, very different model. And the idea is exactly this, to design it around a problem, could be one of the um, sustainable development goals kind of problem and bring students from multiple perspectives, faculty from multiple perspectives, to come up with solutions and to think about how to approach it. And I, and I think we're being pushed by students. And if we really care about student success, which we say we do, especially for underrepresented first generation students, one of the best ways to engage them is to have them thinking about the impact that they're going to have on the world. I mean, they really do think this way because they feel the urgency that we don't. They're looking at the span of their lives. Um, if, they're, if, uh, if there's a child born today, they're going to be 80 in 2100. Uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is a different frame than for many of us. And so they're seeing an urgency that perhaps we should see, but uh, we may see intellectually, but we don't feel emotionally. They do. And I think they're going to force us to think differently about how we organize. And I couldn't agree with Michael more than to say that we should have multiple kinds, that everything has a way to make a, a contribution, and the accountability should be to be true to what you're there to do, to be responsible in how you're spending your resources, and to show some outcomes in terms of the actual impact of the work that you're doing. Just related to that, so just in the last month, we now have verification by 98% of the working scientists that the signal that we're sending into the future to, you'll all be dead in this room, but to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, for certain, is a two degree Celsius change in the average temperature of the planet, as well as as many of the negative outcomes as you can conceive of that are derivative of that. That's already done. That's finished. That signal's already been sent. But because no one in this room will be alive then, we, it's beyond our conceptualization. You should see the possible signals that we could send if we don't change the trajectories that we're on. It's unbelievable. Wes, did you want to explain? Yeah, I think, uh, again, it's very difficult to disagree with anything um, that I'm hearing um, because I agree with you. Um, as you create this multiple types of higher education institutions, the question is, how do we communicate that to the non-higher education institution people, the politicians, 
the journalists, the parents, the students, the, you know, the, the job seekers, the employers, because they're the ones who are judging us. Yeah. And whatever we try to do in the university isn't going to make a difference unless they become our allies. So yes. this communicating the narrative properly from us and back and forth becomes that much more important. We, we can't put walls up and say we're going to do what we do. And I'm not saying that that's what we do, but I think we don't have as much expertise in that communication narrative yet. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Wyas. And I, I think the other thing around this is we've talked a lot about this, the internal structures of uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, but I think those structures also have to create those semi-permeable membranes in which we can actually partner to a greater extent uh, with civil society, um, with uh, cities, uh, with our governments, um, with industry to solve problems together. And, and I think that there has been this sense of a, a wall around the university of time being frozen and that the next challenge, I think, structurally for us is to think about, and I know a lot of universities are engaged in these kinds of partnerships, um, but they need to be deep and meaningful and driving toward change. And, I think and you're there are lending ways your to experts that. to these people. They Absolutely. serve in the government. They serve in different, you know, Absolutely. Bodies. And reciprocal learning is so important. We have as much to gain from that in terms of understanding the issues of the day and understanding, you know, uh, different perspectives being brought into um, the institution as well. And, and I think many of our institutions, um, whether they're urban or rural, we certainly, I'm in an urban environment, but I hear this as well from my colleagues in more rural environments. Um, you know, we really, particularly state universities, I mean, we were designed to serve our regions. And so there's something all already inherent in the DNA and um, really to think about some of these urban challenges, which are part of the SDGs, by the way. Uh, but think about housing, think about transportation, think about um, environmental sustainability. In California, think about wildfires and how do you create resilience. Um, these can only be done in partnership with the local communities, um, with the nonprofits who care about it, with industry, which has a critical role. And, and I am, I'm certainly seeing a lot more engagement in that way. Um, but it's not from your traditional elite, high-ranking institutions. So it's, again, it's about how we talk about the work that we do and how we really think about the values that we project um, and what role rankings like the Times Higher Ed Impact Rankings can play in changing the conversation about what's valued. And I think that's the communication strategy. In some ways, rankings is a communication strategy um, that represents what we value. And so many of the newer ones coming out today are trying to say, that what we've traditionally valued um, may have played a role, uh, a had a purpose at one point, but they don't capture what we need to do going forward. One, 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 one comment, um, uh, Phil, on this. To, um, you know, one of the reasons that we don't do a good job communicating to the public or the journalists or the politicians is because we don't do a good job communicating with each other inside the university. So, yeah. so, so, so the, 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 the fault of the matter is internal to the institution. Years ago, very quickly, a friend of mine won the Blue Planet Prize, this big prize by the Japanese government for environmental things. And I had a knockdown, drag out, shouting match with him that day. He won this prize. He was a National Medal of Science winner, an unbelievable, he's a friend of mine. When he said, why do you keep funding these ecologists, Crow? They're all idiots. There's nothing in ecology that's even scientific. We geochemists are the only ones that are gonna be able to save the planet from ourselves. I'm saying, this guy's name was Wally. I said, Wally, the only idiot I'm seeing today is standing right in front of me. Uh, and, so, and so the point is, is that even he, a, gen a genius, a mega genius of the highest order, didn't know how to understand what was going on inside his own institution. And so, we have to figure this out inside the academy for anyone to have any chance of grasping what's going on uh, inside the academy from outside the academy. So the problem, again, rests with us. We have about 70 seconds left. That almost feels like the perfect note to end on, but does anyone else want to just jump in in the final 60 seconds now? I, no, I would ask THE to continue to look at different ways of assessing and, and you know, not just an across the board global ranking, because it's just too generic, you know? And this impact ranking has really helped. And I think THE should come up with other things that matter 
for university to to the society. Yeah, and, and I will just add that, and, and I just note the the connection now between Inside Higher Ed and uh, Times Higher Ed. It, it's really great to have that because I I really don't believe that the SDGs are well known and well understood in the United States. And I think most of our institutions, frankly, don't really talk about them. We talk about the ideas that they are, but we don't talk them in the framework of of um, you know the United Nations and what it's and and the global environment and that. And I think the pandemic forced us uh, into recognizing that sort of global interconnectedness that we we pay lip service to in many cases, but we don't really talk about it. And you go and you ask most students at most of our institutions if they know about what these are, and they're, they're probably going to look at you a little bit blankly. That's on us um, to really, I think, uh, take this and adopt it and begin to have different conversations. Thank you very much. Yeah, and actually the Times Higher Education Inside Higher, higher Ed Partnership means we have about 50 million uh, higher education uh, readers across the world. So in terms of propagating these messages, getting that message out, we're a, an incredibly privileged partner to, to your institutions. But that was an amazing panel. What a fantastically easy job it was for me as moderator. That was wonderful. So massive thank you.